welcome to the Pastured Pig Podcast, where we share the successes and challenges of raising pigs on pasture. We talk to producers all over the country, from small homesteads to large commercial pasture operations. Whether you're new to pastured pigs or have been raising hogs for decades, we hope you hear new ideas and new perspectives on pasturing hogs. Here's your host, Troy McClung. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Pastured Pig Podcast. Uh, excited to, to be here with another episode. And I dare not say that, I'm going to say it anyway, I guess. I'm a little bit of a roll, I think. What is this, four episodes in five weeks? Shocking. Um, but um, I'm trying something new. So as I get interviews, I'm trying to go ahead and cue them up. So my update portion, what I call my bumpers, what I'm recording right now, may not be as fresh but um, I think this is going to help me stay on task to be able to get things queued up. And that way, if something pops up where I say, oh, I, I got to come back and make an announcement, then I can always um, re-record the bumpers and, and upload. But bear with me. I think this is what we're going to try. That being said, as I do this, it also allows me to see my calendar uh, in the holes that are in it. So uh, this interview, at the time of recording this bumper, I got nobody left uh, teed up. Well, that's not true. I got one more to reach out to. Jim, if you're listening, I haven't forgotten you. Uh, I'm going to reach out to you. But um, I need some more people in the queue. I need some more topics. I need some more farms to talk to. I need some more updates from people that have been on the podcast. If you haven't been on the podcast within a year, um, and we maybe want to get an update of what you've got going on. So reach out to me, Troy at RedToolHouse.com, or use the pre-screen info on the PasturedPig.com website. The pre-screen helps the best. That way I can line everything up. I can actually just sort sort that stuff. But um, so getting on to today's interview, so I had this really good conversation with Tyler, Tyler Hill at Evergreen Farm in Pennsylvania. And Tyler is, um, is doing something unique. Well, I, I wouldn't say no, totally unique, but he, he's doing something I find interesting. Uh, just through um, Providence, we'll say, he ended up with an AGH and a Hampshire cross. And so I, we spend some time, spend the majority of the time talking about the pros and cons of that cross and the ramifications of that. That, to me, is an interesting cross. And I know he's not the first guy in the world to do that, but that's the, I think he's the first one I've talked to that's doing that. So uh, I, I think you'll find this interesting. Uh, it's a good conversation we have. Tyler's an easy guy to talk to, good flow of the conversation. So uh, without any further ado, let's hear from uh, Evergreen Farm. Today, we are just going north of the Mason-Dixon line. We're going to Evergreen Farm in Pennsylvania, and we're talking with Tyler Hill. Welcome, Tyler. Hi, Troy. How you doing? Thanks for having me. Yeah, doing well, man. Appreciate you coming on the podcast. So how are things up in the Allentown area today? Uh, it's going well. It's spring. So, you know, we're busy on the farm, working as well as a full-time job. So trying to balance all that amongst um, doing the farm life. So we are busy to say the least. All right. Well, so so tell me a little bit about Allen, not Allentown. I know about Allentown. Tell me a little bit about Evergreen Farm. Uh, kind of give me that 40,000 foot elevation. Sure. So um, Evergreen Farm, as I call it, um, we're a small homestead, um, a little north of Allentown, like you alluded to, um, about 20 to 30 minutes north of Allentown. Um, small farm. I actually grew up on a, a family farm. Um, animals were not a thing. Um, it was more, more of a Christmas tree farm. So I um, always had an interest in farming. Um, and then I went off to school, um, went off to college. I was one in the family to, to go off to college more so on a path um, to play sports. But upon graduation, um, you know, when we settled down, uh, you know, I ended up getting married and so forth. Um, farming had always been something that I wanted to do. So found ourselves a property that actually connects um, to my parents' Christmas tree farm. So really fortunate there. I'm pretty much living almost where I grew up. Um, and then I really um, got into raising animals, starting small like most homesteaders would starting with um, chickens in a garden and eventually up to uh, sheep and and now pigs. Excellent. Excellent. So in, in that area, how would you describe your topography? Is it rolling? Is it mountainous? Is it flat? Yeah, so we are just um, north of the Blue Mountain, um, which is part of the Appalachian Trail. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so it's, it's rolling mountainous in some areas. Um, but kind of where we're at, you know, kind of rolling Hills. Um, I don't really have a flat piece of property on my farm. Yeah. I'm definitely rolling in that aspect. Um, so yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I've been up in that neck of the woods. I can, I can picture it in my head, but trying for our, uh, our listeners to try to wrap their brain around it. So I would say you probably don't have a huge elevation relief on your property, but like you said, there's nothing tabletop flat because it has a, a gentle slope and, and rolling area throughout, I guess. That's correct. <clears throat> okay. All right. So, um, so you mentioned that uh, you, you, you kind of did the, the homesteaders basic trajectory. You started with chickens in a garden and then kind of just, just kept getting larger and larger livestock. What led you to pigs uh, after, at, at a certain point? What made you think, okay, pigs are the next thing to put on the farm? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think a lot of it comes down to just kind of uh, my mentality of always wanting to do something more. And um, we have quite a bit of land. Um, we're sitting on 53 acres. So part of me also thinks, you know, what am I going to do with all this land? How do we going to, how are we going to maintain it? Um, so starting with the chickens, obviously, and then we went to sheep, which obviously sheep will take up a, a bunch of space. And then, um, the pigs kind of came in. There's a couple reasons for the pigs. I would say that the biggest was more so going down that health path of, you know, looking for high quality pork. You know, obviously you hear all the time what you can, what you get out of the store and you read labels and things like that. And, kind of getting an understanding of where your meat out of the grocery store is coming from kind of led me down that road to I can do this myself type thing. And then there's also, you know, a, a cost associated with it. If I'm trying to buy a premium product, you know, I figure I, I can raise that myself as well. So that's um, the primary driver as to why we went to to pigs on the farm. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Very good. So um, our dear with that 53 acres is that um is there a lot of pasture grass for your sheep or is it a combination of, of woods and, and clearing how do you have that uh divvied up between the sheep and the and the pigs yeah so right now the pigs are the pigs are on a smaller plot um we actually have a, a sliver of woods where there's actually um a field on one side and now like i said in the beginning being that we are connected to uh, my parents christmas tree farm they actually lease um, part of that land and plant Christmas trees on it as well. So that does help us maintain um, so much acreage. So on that side, we have Christmas trees. On the opposite side, um, we actually have sheep pasture. So right now the pigs are kind of, the goal for that is to actually clear that section of woods. Like I said, it's about an acre um, and we have it sectioned off into two. And very soon here in the future, um, it'll be a third section. So about a third of an acre um, for each paddock. Oh, very good. And just rotating him through, uh, through that area there to help clear it out. Correct. Yeah. And it was, I mean, it was so thick that you couldn't walk through that area. So that's why we kind of went there. Um, and really what they're doing now, I keep them on there probably a little longer, um, than you traditionally would, but we're, we're using them to kind of clear the land and prep it for the future. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a perfect example of where you want, to delay rotation because you want that additional disturbance and being able to uproot a lot of that underbrush that you're trying to get out of there. Absolutely. So has that, um, has that worked out well? Have, have, you, have you noticed that in the time that you've had them in there that they're taking care of everything or there's some areas that you're having to maybe concentrate them on and, and get them to focus or, or are they just kind of blasting through everything? You know, it's it's crazy how how much work pigs will do for you. Um, I really I never, you know, took that for what it is until we got them in there and and started to see over the you know a couple of weeks even the the results that we've seen. So originally when we got them, uh, um, I mean my story for getting them is is something too, but we can talk about that here in a minute. Mm -hmm. But originally when we got them, um, I, I didn't have you know a ton of plans to rotate them as as frequently, but man, they're doing work. So again, they're in the second paddock. We're about to move them to the third and they clear out. Like I said, they, you couldn't walk through there and now it's pretty much completely bare. Obviously we have a bunch of hardwoods and stuff still standing, mm -hmm. which poses another challenge. Um, you know, they tend to, you know, brush up against and, and strip the bark, which <laughs> can be detrimental to those hardwoods as well. Yeah. 
Yeah. So are we, uh, I assume in that part of Pennsylvania, do you, are you dealing with a lot of autumn, autumn olive and multiflora rose and, and green briar? What, what are all your underbrush issues there? Yeah. A lot of, that was pretty much all full of briars and yeah, pretty much anything you could think of in, in this area. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. So have you, have you, I assume obviously in the paddocks you're providing feed, are you, uh, have you been able to take advantage or, or do you, do you need to put feed in, in creative locations? I've discovered that with my pigs sometimes. It's like, hey, I'm going to put feed in the trough, but we're also going to throw a handful over here right at the base of this big multiflora rose bush and, and uh, see them take care of some of these more stubborn areas. Yeah, absolutely. Um, when we first had them, so we started with two. Um, it was just a boar and a sow. And at that point, yeah, there was, I mean, there was so much forage in a, in a pasture that size. Um, so we definitely had to kind of lead them to certain spots to start. Um, but as they, I guess you'd say multiplied and we had our, our first litter of, of piglets, um, it, they quickly just took over everything. And as you know, pigs will, they'll eat down to every square inch and they'll root every square inch. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So you, you mentioned that you started with a boar and a sow. How, how many head do you have now? So we're at nine right now. We have the boar and the sow still. They're pretty much our constant. Um, and then we have um, four-month-old piglets. So the seven um, piglets are, are four months old at this point. Okay. All right. So, uh, yeah, that's interesting. So I, I think in in, in your pre, pre-screening information is kind of where the meat of the conversation I want to take this because you have an interesting cross that you're doing. And, and I think that's kind of the core of the discussion here is, uh, tell our listeners ab- about your cross that you have and what brought you to the point of having those two breeds to, to put together. Yeah, so this is where, you know, I'll kind of kick it off with, you know, my story on how I found these to start. Um, so knowing I wanted to get into pigs, you know, I, I doing a bunch of research and obviously you, you kind of get an understanding of, of some of the breeds. And you, I kept seeing that, you know, American guinea hog um, meat is, is kind of a delicacy, um, well, at least considered that by, by many. Um, and then I also knew, you know, the Hampshires, um, that was kind of a staple um, in, as, as far as like a bacon pig type, a larger framed animal. Um, and I just so happened, you know, I was surfing the Internet all over the place looking for the right pigs. Um, and I, I was probably getting a little too picky at the time, but I happened to find. And I would caution people for, for looking on Craigslist, um, but I actually happened to find them on Craigslist. And, you know, I'll be honest, the selling point to these animals, somebody was advertising them as um, $60 a piece. So we went there and yeah, it was a nice setup. The guy was, it was very friendly, um, but you could tell he wasn't very sure of, of the whole thing. Um, I don't think he really knew what he had there. Turns out it, it ends up being a great breed, but, Anyway, I thought I was actually buying two boars, um, and when I got there, one was a boar and one was a sow, so that's how we ended up with um, with what we have now. Ironically enough, you know, being that I paid $120 um, for the two total, she was bred at the time. They weren't exactly piglets. They were a little, um, they were um, weaned for a while, so she actually ended up farrowing piglets shortly thereafter um so we ended up getting all these extra pigs for the price of of two um so it's definitely a really interesting part there um but back to kind of that breed um again it's just more of a combination type thing understanding that the american guinea hog and the hampshire are both interesting breeds and i'm like you know what for that price we'll see kind of what that mix ends up um how that those genetics shake out there yeah so so were they are are they already crosses or was was the sow the one breed and the and the boar the other? How did how did how did they how did those manifest? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, they were actually already crosses, and um, I'm going to get this wrong, but some of the original pigs um, from that farm, what they were, um, one was a, a, a purebred um, American Guinea hog, and then the other was primarily Hampshire. I think that one actually did have some um, Guinea hog in it, but there was definitely one. Um, pure American guinea there. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, because that, that's, the, that's the thing that kind of pops in my head initially is just, you know, the issue of frame, you know, the, the frame of an AGH versus the frame of a, of a, a full-size Hampshire. You know, there's, 
I wouldn't say there's some incompatibility, but there's some challenges there with the you know, the frame and conformation of those those two breeds and, and how that works out. If it was, you know, an AGH boar servicing a, a Hampshire sow or vice versa, you know, that, that there's some some different challenges that come along with that. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, we're seeing that with the, the litter of piglets. And that's why, you know, I'm finding this really interesting and almost I don't want to call it an experiment because obviously you're dealing with you know, livestock, you're dealing with animals and, and something that you're looking to produce for, for food. But we're seeing a lot of variation in the offspring as far as size. Um, our sow is, is pretty small. Um, so I, I would like to believe that she's primarily, you know, carrying that AGH genetic when our boar, he's, you know, he's big. He's, uh, he's definitely more of the Hampshire look. You know, he has all the characteristics, the, the, the white belt, the ears and, and all that as well. Hmm. Now, when you say big, how big? I mean, we're we talking um, 200 pounds. We're we talking 500 pounds. He's probably a good <gasps> 350 at okay. least. So he's decent yeah, size he's, then. And he's, uh, at this point, he would be maybe 18 months old. Oh, okay. So Steve, he has still a little bit of potential then if he's got some AGH in him. So he could get a little bit bigger. Yeah, I mean, he definitely, he, he's got size to him. But again, comparatively speaking to her, he's quite a bit larger. Yeah. So that's something, again, and we're experiencing that with the, the piglets. You know, we, we the first um, litter of piglets, we grew out last year and, and then we processed off. And we, we saw quite a bit of variation there as well. So it's interesting to see kind of what's going to happen here in the future, um, you know, as, as we have more more piglets. Yeah, yeah. So you've so you've had two litters so far through this pairing. Correct. Yeah, yeah. we're on the second litter right now. Yeah. And so, what was the number of uh, viable piglets in the first litter? Um. So we had eight, and then unfortunately, she did roll up on two of them. Mm -hmm. Um. We get this wrong now. It was several months back, but yeah, I think we ended up with six that we. Okay. And now, right now, um, her second litter, I believe it was actually eight again, and now we're left with seven. Yeah. Yeah. But we're seeing, you're seeing actual <clears throat> viability as far as, as uh, uh, pig, piglet hitting the ground before mom has a chance to crush or anything. You're seeing a um, pretty good percentage of viable pigs being, being birthed. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, and she seems to be... Um, a really great sow as well. And I know I'm kind of straying off topic here a little, um, but I did, and I didn't put this in the pre-screen. Um, I did also throw in some um, IPPs um, last spring, um, just as something different. To, again, first time doing it, kind of want to see what I liked. Um, unfortunately, they didn't play out as well. Um, mm -hmm. One got sick very early on um, and didn't make it. And then one, um, we actually had a small litter from her um, and she had some complications. I believe it was an infection, so she didn't make it either. Um, but the cool thing is that her um, couple piglets actually survived, and our, our sow, the AGH Hampshire cross sow, basically took took them right in, which was really oh, yeah. fascinating to me. Oh, okay. And, and that's that's current. So they're th those uh, IPPs were still around, or that was in that first go round. Yes, the, um, one of the piglets is is an IPP. Yep. Yeah. Well, an IPP cross at this point. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Okay. So you said something there that there's there's variation in the piglets. So uh, unpack that a little bit. What kind of variation are you seeing? And is it is it size, conformation, um, yeah, feed consumption? What are all the different things you're seeing there? Yeah. So I mean, even um, even as far as markings you know we have a couple that are you know and, and it's not always the case where the AGHs are going to be like that pure black but we have a couple like that um, a couple that look just obviously even at a younger age um, look more like a hamp um, the size definitely the size you, you notice there's some that are, are really starting to grow out at four months and then there's some that are still pretty small um, and, and as someone that's looking at them as you know future pork um, that, that can be a, a bit of a challenge too, but then I have to remind myself kind of what I'm dealing with and the results that we had from the first grow out. Um, so I can't expect obviously, um, a, as much of a yield as, as you would off your traditional, you know, Hampshire, Berkshire or whatever. 
Um, but yeah, definitely, definitely seeing differences. Yeah. Yeah. So with that first litter of, of six, what, what was your grow out time? How long did you take them before you, well, let me back the truck up a little bit further there. So with the six hogs, was that, um, you were, you were finishing those for some for personal consumption, I assume, but were you, were you selling any of those? Were you, were you just, uh, processing all those for your own consumption? Um, for our own consumption and, and family and friends. Okay. Um, that's kind of where we're at right now um, with our farm. Um, eventually, you know, obviously there's always chance you can scale up. And I, and I think that through all the time, kind of how I want to approach our future. I know we, we'll talk about that a little more here. Mm-hmm. But um, for this time around, it was just family, friends, um, you know, mm-hmm. kind of sharing, sharing the pork. Yeah. So what was your what was your grow out time? How long did you let them grow out before you processed? Yeah, so those were relatively shorter um, as far as a grow out. And that's something I learned, um, but really we were kind of forced into that time um, due to the, the season um, as far as, you know, Christmas season. Obviously, I, having help um, with my family, and, and as I mentioned, um, a Christmas tree farm, right. they were very busy. So as far mm-hmm. as being able to help out as well. Um, and then I also had some obligations with work where I had to travel. So there was a, kind of a small window um, where we were able to do them. Um, so it was about an eight month grow out. Looking back um, and what I'm planning on doing this year um, is growing them out probably closer to almost the full year. Mm, yeah. Yeah. So did you see in that the six that went eight months, was there was there a, a, a wide variety or a wide range in the hanging weights? Did you have some that were, were exhi- exhibiting more Hampshire characteristics were finishing heavier or, or how did that shake out? There was definitely there was definitely some variation, but honestly, for the most part, um, they did. They they all were relatively similar. Um, again, it, they were definitely smaller. I, I'll be the first to admit, um, pushing two hundred pounds live, so about one hundred and twenty ish hanging, which is a small pig as far as you know market standard and things like that. But again, that's thinking more about it. That it's kind of what we're dealing with a slower growing pig you know you can't expect a whole lot out of the agh genetic um you know a lot of times they don't even get that big to begin with yeah, so. I was gonna say, that, that's not bad you're from the agh side that's a nice that's a nice finished hog and in, in correct <laughs> interesting so uh, so you, you've had those six you, you you raise them out for eight months you've processed so obviously you've had time to consume what are you seeing in the flavor profile, the other characteristics of the meat? What 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 excites you about it or what maybe disappoints you about it? Well, what excites me um, makes a lot of people laugh. I enjoy the fat. <laughs> I mean, and they definitely have, you know, a ton of fat um, to the point where, and, and it's also the way we process. We did the processing on farm. So, you know, I did all my own cuts and things like that. So I leave a lot of that fat. But our chops, you know, it, it would almost look like some of them had, you know, pretty much a 50-50 ratio as far as uh, <laughs> lean meat and fat. Um, so I, I enjoy that. Um, it's just kind of, again, going down that health road. You know, I, I think that is uh, an important piece to, to a diet. Um, and then also just, you know, the tenderness and, and the color. Um, you know, you pull that stuff out and there's a noticeable difference. Um, I, I actually did a comparison, uh, you know, amongst store-bought uh, pork chops versus you know what we raised and and there's absolutely a difference so um i was really thrilled um the first time around again i i would have liked them to be a little larger Uh, we didn't get a whole lot of bacon um just due to the nature of uh, of kind of that size but i'm overall very happy with the results now um since you're dealing with a lard pig obviously and you mentioned you like having fat do you do you keep fat for rendering? Do you use it uh, just actual the fat itself versus leaving it on the cuts? Did you have a, a processing plan for all that extra lard? Yeah, so I actually ended up leaving on, like I said, I, I left on a lot of it. So, you know, there was a lot of back fat that, you know, we probably could have done a little more with. And, and again, being it was the first time, um, you know, I, I think there's a lot of takeaways from that first time you do anything. So next time around, you know, we definitely have, you know, some ideas, obviously with, with the other animals that we're raising, you know, keeping some of that fat for mixing um, with grind and things like that. Um, it's definitely in the future. Um, I ground a lot of fat into our sausage. You know, we made a bunch of sausage up, um, definitely on the fattier side as well. 
Um, so a lot of that stuff got used, but you know, unfortunately there was a little bit of waste as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you had plenty to work with there for sure. What do you, (laughs) so what did you think about the, the flavor profile? What's that? Sorry. Uh, what did you think about the flavor profile, the, 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 the actual taste of the meat? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, it actually, it, it eats almost more like that of beef, um, which I know sounds crazy and I'm sure you can relate to this a little bit, but it just didn't, I feel like if I would have given this to some people, they, they wouldn't even think it was pork. You know, like I alluded to the meat, um, very dark. Um, I actually just um, had a pork steak yesterday that I cut from the from the back um, back leg, and meat was very dark. Um, it didn't, you know, obviously it doesn't have that that pale look to it. And again, the the flavor just has that. Um, you know, it's hard hard to explain in sometimes flavor in conversation, but like I, the best comparison would be it eats m- more similar to beef. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I would definitely I can understand that. That's that's what I feel with uh, with our combination that we have that. Yeah, especially when you're looking at like a pork chop or, or anything off the loin that you just get a, you get a tender you get a tender cut you get a texture that is is very similar to beef and you know if it's cooked right again you, you pork you cook a little bit more than you do the beef uh, but if it's cooked right then it then it has that right marbling then yeah you, you can get a lot of the sim, most uh, similar profiles and and that's with an unseasoned piece. And here lately, the the boys and I've been playing around with different different seasonings and things, and and livening it up even more. So it it is interesting, and I and I think that's an important thing, especially you know you're looking at six hogs that you're going to have for yourself and friends and family. That's that's a lot of work on on farm processing. It's it's a lot of storage. It's there's just a lot of effort in it. So you want to make sure you're maximizing the enjoyment of that at the on the final side. That hey, it, this is actually a joy to sit down and eat versus well, you know, it's it's sustenance, it's calories. That's kind of how we're looking at it. And uh, but to really be able to enjoy that and say this is this is a quality you know quality item that we've raised here. Absolutely, and there's there's so many options with pork. You can do like you said about the different you know seasonings, things like that. You can do you know there's endless possibilities as to what you can produce out of this meat, and even just ground pork. I mean, there's endless endless amounts of options. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah. So, so you mentioned uh, um, first to go around. You know, you, there's some learning experiences there. Obviously, some takeaways. So you've got you've got seven on deck for, um, and I, I can't remember if you told me or not. But so, how far? How old are they right now? The the seven that you have. Yep, they're about uh, four months. A little okay. over four months. So yeah, so you're you're looking at uh, well, you're looking at Christmas season to be processing if you're going to go that full year. You, you'll be Pro- processing probably yeah, right <laughs> right before. You're parents, like I'm thinking like November ish. Your parents are going so to beat be... you like a drum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're going to be busy. Yeah, yeah. So so what do you think? you've you've learned or what are you going to do differently with these seven for everything from from maybe finishing out with the feed to the processing whether you're going to do it on farm uh yeah the cuts you end up doing what what's some of the takeaways you learned from first herd to now this herd yeah so the first um herd there you know getting into it um you know, you, you jump into things sometimes and, you know, you have a plan, but you're not really sure. And, and as you know, with pigs, um, feed is definitely your, your number one cost. You know, pigs are not cheap to, to raise as far as a feed um, standpoint. So I did, um, I'll be honest, I, I, I probably cheaped out a little bit as far as raising the first herd out. Um, and now um, I actually was able to um, acquire a bunch of brewer's grain um, from a local brewery here in Pennsylvania, um, which is really helping me supplement our costs and and feed there. Um, so I'm able to give them a little bit better feed. And then also the forage, they're going to have a full year of forage. Obviously, early spring right now, um, growth is coming in. And that's why I'm a little hesitant to move them. I want that next paddock to kind of grow up a little more. Um, but then over the course of the year, you know, we'll, we'll supplement them with, with all that stuff. Hopefully in the fall, we get a good a- acorn dropping. Um, we're gonna have a bunch of apples and stuff from the trees that we'll we'll feed them as well to supplement. So there's a lot of variation in their diet. Um, but like I said in the beginning, um, 
probably don't don't cheap out on feed. I guess that's probably number one um, because you end up probably paying more um, by feeding them even some corn and stuff like that because it just doesn't have the, the nutrition that, that that of a higher quality feed would. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's my goodness. There's a whole other discussion to unpack there, but that's good. That's a good observation <laughs> for sure. And, you know, you mentioned something there that I think is going to be extremely helpful is the fact that your your maturity, the life cycle of this herd is going to round out. So they're going to finish on, uh, like I said, depending on the mass situation, they're going to finish on some nice forage, a lot of heavy protein, depending on the, the makeup of your hardwood forest area there. And that's really going to affect flavor profile and, of course, affect finishing weight. Yeah, I'm really excited to to have the timing kind of work out this way, this go around. Um, I, I just think that fall period is is more of an ideal window to to do the processing. Um, like you said, exactly. You know, it, they'll have you know prime forage at that point. I had even thought about you know planting a small plot um, plot of pumpkins to kind of just add some variation and, and more supplementation as well. Yeah, yeah. No, we we've definitely played around with that. There's. Um... Oh, I, I knew as soon as that popped in my mind, I'd forget the name of it. But there's a um, there's a a, a beet like it, it's a it's in the beet family, but it's something that um, uh, Sean and Beth Dower, uh, Doherty gave us when we were um, the last time we met them, and it's um, that's a real funny name. Shoot, but it's the exact same thing. This idea of planting forage and kind of being yeah. ahead of the curve. There, I really like the idea of you know because pumpkins. Unless you have really, really heavy whitetail uh, deer pressure, which you probably do up there in that part of the, the Pennsylvania. Yeah, which we do. <laughs> yeah. Um, if you can keep them from destroying it, then you know, pumpkins are easy to grow, especially if there's a little bit of good soil there. And you kind of set and forget on a lot of those, and the pigs are going to come in when that's ready and, and just have a field day with, with all that extra forage. And, of course, like you said, finding the brewer's grain. It sounds like you guys got some apples around. All that stuff is going to be very very helpful to reduce that feed intake but like i said that that should justify you being able to go uh, do your research and put it in the budget to afford a more quality well-rounded feed that has you know all the all the ingredients that that the pigs need to, to really maximize the growth potential yeah absolutely it's uh and we're gonna we're actually going to take i know your original question was you know kind of how we're gonna what our timeline was for these. We're actually going to take um, two of these piglets and, and move them over to um, my parents' part of their property. And, and my dad's actually going to try to experiment a little more um, grain-free type situation. So we might have to raise them out a little longer, hmm. um, but he's just going to kind of see how, how that will all work out as well. So again, learning all this stuff, um, which is really fascinating, just seeing how they react to the different things. This brewer's grain, I actually just picked up um, my second pickup today. It's uh, pretty much going to be a 300 pounds a week, um, which is, you know, with that many pigs, it's, it's a lot of feed for me. So it's it's good. But I'm, kinda, I'm curious to see over the long run how they react to it, you know, what type of growth they put on from it. You obviously read a lot of different things on on can it be their sole diet or, or is there supplementation required? So I'm, I'm looking at all that stuff and just observing closely at this point. Yeah. Yeah. And that's great. And I think that's so important is as you go along to, to not only observe, but to document. And, and that's, that's always been my Achilles heel is I'll observe. I'm like, oh, I need to write that down. And then usually end up forgetting, but, but being able to, to, to at least be aware of the things you need to look for and understand the variables that are involved in the, the variables that you can control and the variables that you can't control. So like weather and, and production of mast and all those things is, is stuff that's beyond our control. But uh, the amount of rotation, the amount of front end forage that you plant, um, you know, the feed that you purchase, of course, and of course, the timeline of the life cycle, all those things you can control. And, and those variables, if you document them and observe them, then of course, you get to make those adjustments. Um, so there's one thing, and again, this is probably this is probably not an answerable question very much since you you don't have a control either way. But it's interesting. So when you look at AGH, and you know they're known to be a really good forage pig. They they, they can find all kinds of stuff in the woods and on, on grass and all those things. So they're able to really extract a lot of protein from natural elements. 
And then my experience with Hampshire, because uh, that's what we started with, is it's kind of the exact opposite. They like to tear up a lot of ground, but they're not necessarily getting a lot of nutrient out of what they're tearing up. You know, they're the ones that are the, the in, in my experience, were the first ones at the feed bowl, you know, really eating all the feed, and then they just go dig foxholes because they were bored. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I just, I'd, I'd love to, you know, in my experience, I'd love to be a fly on the wall and just watch your, your piglets day after day and be like, okay, you know, are they exhibiting more of the AGH trait? Or are they exhibiting more of the Hampshire trait with what they're doing to the pasture and the benefits they're getting from that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, they, they certainly root enough. So I wish I could answer that question as well. You know, seeing what they're actually pulling out of the ground. Um, I, like I said, I, I know that they, they've pretty much tilled up the entire um, paddock. And also to your point, you know, the Hampshire, I, I said our boar is probably more Hampshire. He is absolutely the first one to the feed dish. Um, and, and that's characteristics of a boar as well, probably. Sure. But yeah. um, being that we let them in, like I said, longer um, intentionally, there were some deep craters dug. Um, but it is, it's, it would be really interesting to see how they're actually converting that, that tilling and what yeah. they're actually pulling out of the ground. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and of course, you'll, you'll see that a lot as, as the, as the uh, paddock recovers, what's recovering? What's recovering fast? And you know, okay, well, they really didn't mess with that. They maybe just kick some dirt over on it. But sure. then what's not coming back? So, like, I know um, on our property that autumn olive, if it actually produced fruit, so if it, it happened to have pigs in pasture when it was actually fruiting, then my hampshires would wear that stuff out. I mean, they would ride a bush down and they would strip it to nothing and pretty much just eradicate that that bush. And and so there's you know just just kind of different things you kind of watch and of course, you know, uh, juvenile poison ivy, they they tend to just eat it a lot and, and that's not just hampshire. That was all my pigs like the the tender shoots of the juvenile poison ivy. Um and so, you know, so some of these nuisance things, but like multiflora rose, they, they really wouldn't mess with it. So I'd have to take cracked corn and, and toss a handful of it in the dead center of the of the, sure. uh, you know, the, the root base area there to get them to, to tear that up. But, you know, it's just, it's just funny. It's just all these things that just roll in my head here. I'm thinking, you know, if somebody would say, hey, I'm looking to do a lot of ground disturbance and really till up some ground here. And I'm thinking of AGH, I would say you're going 180 degrees the wrong direction, go this direction. But then if somebody <laughs> says, hey, I'm looking for something to that's going to forage well with all this additional mass, I'm going to be adding a natural, for, a natural forage and, and then the planted forage. Well, what would you recommend for a, a homesteading pig? It's like, oh, okay, yeah, have you ever considered AGH? <laughs> so it's like, it's like you, you kind of you have this really interesting mashup, not only in the, in the breed, but in your setup and configuration of your paddock. So I, I, yeah, I, I think it's intriguing and, and love to have you back in about in a year or so and just see you know, just, just how this experiment has played out. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting, and I, I, you know, you saying about the the poison ivy, um, you know, kind of triggered a thought as well. Um, you know, a couple of years back, before we did any of the the really the animal thing, um, I actually had my garden set up over kind of in that same area, and it was riddled with poison ivy. So I'm, I'm curious to see kind of what they do mm. um, to that poison as it kind of starts to come up now um, in the spring here. Oh, so it'll yeah. be it'll be interesting, but it's yeah. To your point with the the crossbreed. Yeah, I guess it's, you never really know what you're going to get. Um, and that's why I think observation is, is so important in, in this instance. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So looking ahead, Tyler, yeah, if you're looking at the next year, maybe the next one to five years, well, five years, I know, since you're, you're kind of just getting going here, that's, that's maybe not fair to ask you about five years. But first of all, um, if you, if you find that you like this cross, what are you planning on doing as far as breed stock? Are you going to keep this, this boar and sow combo and, and kind of run them as long as you can? Are you looking at doing some line breeding with their offspring and, and kind of getting that next generation of genetics? Or are you thinking about bringing something new in? Yeah, it's an interesting question that I guess I probably should put more thought into it than, than I have, um, quite honestly. Um, right now, kind of the plan is, yes, to, to continue um, with those two as kind of the staples um, as far as breeding. Um, and we'll continue to run, you know, a litter, maybe two a year. Um, it all kind of depends on, on how many hogs I want to have at a time. You know, obviously it comes with, with a lot of feed costs, like I alluded to. Um, 
but as far as line breeding, you know, it would be interesting as well. I guess, I guess I'll have to see kind of what happens um, as we grow them out further. Like I said, the first time I probably could have grown them out longer. So now that we're aiming towards more of a year, if I like the end result, you know, I, I think that's when we kind of explore, okay, what, what do we like about this? And do we go a different route or do we continue to go this route and just grow them out for that, that duration? So it's an interesting question. I, I wish I had a better answer, um, but that's kind of where I'm at right now. Yeah. A lot of stuff going on, you know, as far as just our, our farm overall. Um, I have two young kids as well. So, and working a full-time job. So, there's a lot going on as far as you know making these decisions. Sure, absolutely, yeah. All that, all that rubs against the uh, the desire to to sit and observe and to make all these little tweaks because you know every everything else gets uh, um, neglected and that causes issues as well. Sure, and that's the last thing I want is to do something that I can't handle or you know get in over my head where it because right now I'm I'm loving this you know it's it's something I love to do. And I don't want it to become a point where it's truly a chore that, you know, becomes a burden. Um, but it's definitely, I mean, I got big plans in the future. It's just a matter of kind of which direction I want to move. Yeah. Yeah. So now uh, out of your, your seven that you have now, have you castrated the boars? Are, are they barrows or do you, do you did you leave them intact? So we left, ironically enough, there's um, six gilts and one barrow. So oh, we left him intact. Um being that he's going to most likely hit the freezer um, at the end of the year, I wasn't sure if it was going to be worth it or not. You know, obviously there's always a, a debate on on Bortain and, and so forth, but um, we decided to just let him go. Yeah, I mean, if you're looking at personal consumption and, yeah, it, and it, it obviously there's things that you can do. There's the, the little ear the little ear tag, the plug type things that you could do to, to test if you have Bortain. I mean... Uh, with an AGH as, as small as they are than at the day of processing. We did that when we even processed our um, one of our large black boars. We uh, we went ahead and dispatched him. And when it was time to start cutting him up, the first thing I did was just cut a chunk of fat off his hams and we fried it up real quick just to see if it had, uh, had the right. tanks. So, yeah, there's there's things to get around that before you get too far down downstream. But, yeah, that's... That's interesting. So now you have, you know, you have the potential for second generation um, genetics there. If if you realize, okay, as as we watch this this young boar grow out until December, that you may see characteristics that you like. It's like, oh wow, okay, this this is what he is. He's exhibiting better than his father. So maybe he sticks around, and either you breed him to his mother or even breed him to a sister. If that's uh, Again, if you're looking at those characteristics and keeping that that line breeding going, but the, again, that's that's all about observation, like you said, just just kind of seeing what you're um, what you're observing in conformation, uh, characteristics, attitude, uh, finished weight, all that type of stuff. Sure, yeah, that'll be uh, it'll definitely be interesting to see what happens there, um, and, and I probably have you know being that I have seven, I can certainly make sure that they go to somebody, um, but it's honestly it's probably a little bit much for us right now so if i decide to keep one um you know it, it might not be a bad choice there yeah and and that's you know that's a, kind of another thing i mean that that again just comes with um with observation over multiple generations or at least multiple litters is is seeing if you know the the um American Guinea has those smaller litter numbers, whereas Hampshire can produce some decent, you know, some pretty good sized litter numbers. I mean, we've had my first Hampshire constantly produced, you know, 12 to 14. And, um, and yeah, when you look at it from a homestead personal consumption level with friends and family, you get, you start dropping litters of, you know, 12, 14 uh, piglets, then, then you got to figure out something uh, as far as selling off those piglets or, you know, doing roasters or doing something because, yeah, it, it probably isn't cost effective, nor is it productive when it comes time to process the, to plan on butchering 14 finished pigs at, at one time. So, Yeah, it's a lot to handle on your farm. So that's obviously something I've you know run through my mind several times as as we continue to farrow um, new litters here. You know, do I want to sell a few off? I'm pretty confident just the nature of my work, um, you know, full time work. I could definitely reach out to a few people here and 
I'm pretty confident that they would definitely be interested in a, in a half a hog or, you know, split one with somebody else. So I think that's always a choice or always an option, I should say. Um, so it's just, again, another another um, thing to think about and another part of the planning process. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Well, excellent. Well, Tyler, I want to be sensitive to your time, but I do want to ask you one last question, and I usually ask everybody on the podcast. Uh, in your experience so far, what is your favorite part about raising pigs on pasture? What do you like most about pigs? My favorite part about raising pigs is, honestly, it's it's probably, we talked a lot about it, the observation piece, um, just watching them. You know, pigs definitely carry a very interesting, curious personality. Um, you know, when you're interacting with them and, and you're, you're kind of just around watching you know, they always seem to have, you know, a thought process where a lot of other animals just aren't going to have that. Um, pigs are very intelligent, uh, as you know, you and a lot of your listeners would know. But just, you know, seeing their interactions and, and how they kind of interact with you and with others, um, it's, it's just always fascinating to me. Yeah, very good. Yeah, that's, that's, I say people always talk about chicken TV, and I agree, chickens are fascinating to watch. But I, I think, I think if, if chickens are like, uh, you know, broadcast TV, then uh, then pigs are definitely HBO type thing because it's, it's, I think they're way more entertaining and, and uh, more complicated to figure out sometimes. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, great. Well, man, is there, um, is there any social media presence you have, a website, anything like that? If people want to know more about what you've got going on there, they can check you out. Yeah, absolutely. So about eight months ago, I, I started our journey on YouTube. Um, Evergreen Farm 19. You can find us on YouTube. I pretty much document everything um, from our chickens to our sheep to our pigs, all sorts of other homesteading activities. Um, so that's our, our YouTube channel. Um, we're also at Evergreen 19 or Evergreen Farm 19, sorry, on uh, Instagram and TikTok as well. Awesome. Very good. Very good. Well, man, I appreciate you coming on the podcast and I pray you have a great week. Well, I appreciate Tyler coming on the podcast and having that conversation with me. I'm anxious to to see how this unfolds for him. Uh, he, he has some, uh, obviously, some experience in, in ag, so this isn't his first time uh, at the radio. But with this this specific cross and, and seeing how these finish out after a year, um, it, it's interesting. It's interesting. I'd love to see if you could wave a magic wand and have... Uh, multiple generations to to be able to test and just see how this is working out for him. But it sounds like they're doing what they need to do. They're putting on weight, they're growing, and they're taking care of some really rough areas on his property. And that's one of the one of the beautiful benefits of having pastured pigs is they can definitely clear some ground for you. Well, all right. Well, as I mentioned at the beginning in the front bumper, if you have um, topics, if you'd like to be on the podcast, if you know somebody who I should reach out to, let me know. Um, I would like to still keep talking to some associations. So if I have not, if you're part of an association of a specific breed and we haven't done a podcast on them and you, you want to give me some uh, contact people there to reach out to, I'd be more than happy to do that as well. Well, we'll try to keep this, uh, keep this train of chugging. And I appreciate everyone. Again, I can't thank the Patreon supporters enough. I always feel a little awkward shouting out because I don't know if it's... Um, embarrassing to some or not but man i can't thank you all enough it it really means a lot to me and um i'd love some input on what we could do to to make that better you know i appreciate you guys giving to patreon to help keep this going and and i'd like to continue to find ways to value add our patreon supporters so feel free to shout out let me know what you think we should be doing there all right until next time i pray you all have a great week take care we hope you have enjoyed this episode of the Pastured Pig Podcast. To learn more about our podcast or to submit topics or recommend guests for future episodes, visit redtoolhouse.com.